I have the esteemed pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Dave Girard. Now, Dr. Girard, uh, as many of you know, has been with uh, our departments since uh, 1996. He did his fellowship in uh, urologic oncology at Johns Hopkins after completing his residency at the University of Chicago. He's currently our vice chair of uh, clinical affairs, as well as holds the John P. Livesey chair in urologic oncology. He's the deputy director of our Carbone Cancer Center and uh, recently um, received a very prestigious award via the NCI, the Special Program of Research Excellence or SPORE grant uh, for prostate cancer. And uh, University of Wisconsin now is one of uh, only six uh, centers uh, in the country that have uh, one of these grants funded. Uh, and UW is now uh, really a premier site for prostate innovation. And uh, Dr. Gerard is going to talk to us this morning on advanced uh, prostate cancer, the 2023 guidelines. And uh, thanks again, Dave, for, for being here. Great. Thanks. Can you all hear me? Good. Okay. So uh, a couple of things to realize with regard to advanced prostate cancer. One is that when I first joined the guidelines committee, we uh, would update our guidelines every five or six years. Now it's basically become every other year. So this process of change is really accelerating in the field of prostate cancer. Um, this has actually led to an improvement in survival of patients with adv advanced prostate cancer. When they looked back uh, in England at a large population of men through these stampede trials, the improvement in prostate cancer survival of these, pa of these patients has increased about 14 months on average. So the second thing to realize, though, is that the number of men presenting with advanced prostate cancer is increasing. And part of this has been due to changes in screening. Um, there were the shifts associated with PSA uh, and its recommendations. Another potentially was COVID, although certainly this shift began before then. And the number of men presenting with metastatic prostate cancer has increased from about 3 to 8% here in the United States. And this doesn't have to do with imaging. So it's against this backdrop uh, that we're going to present these uh, guidelines today and realize that the number of men dying from prostate cancer has actually increased over the last few years, in part because of these uh, uh, a couple of uh, competing issues. So it's, it is prostate cancer month, the, the best month of the year. Um, and uh, you heard from uh, Dr. Uh, Wei Huang, who's an outstanding uh, patho GU pathologist here, uh, talking about some of her AI uh, and uh, uh, pathology outcomes. We'll do updates, uh, guideline updates in advanced prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Michael Risk is going to be talking about watchful waiting observation in clinically localized prostate cancer. Again, another very important uh, issue to deal with. And then Dr. Steve Cho, who's really one of the leading experts in the country, and advanced imaging will be talking. Uh, none of the disclosures are relevant to this talk. Uh, so if uh, you want to read about the current guidelines, this was published last month uh, in the Journal of Urology, uh, some of the changes that were uh, made to our guidelines in the past year. And what I'm going to be focusing on are these patients with advanced prostate cancer that have exhausted uh, all local therapy options, uh, by these patients with biochemical recurrence, and those patients presenting with locally advanced oligometastatic and metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. And I'm going to be calling it hormone-sensitive prostate cancer because there's also castration-sensitive prostate cancer, but I think I, I still find the terms confusing in, in my simplistic way. A couple of quick uh, key definitions, biochemical recurrence. In patients that have surgery, uh, it's a rise in the PSA uh, above 0 0.2 with a confirmatory value of 0 0.2 or greater. And with radiation, it's the nadir or the lowest value uh, plus two nanograms per milliliter. So those are, again, the definitions of biochemical recurrence. Uh, Hormone-sensitive prostate cancer has not yet been treated with ADT or is still responsive. Castration-resistant are patients, there are a couple definitions. One is you need to check the testosterone levels, make sure they're less than 50. Uh, and in the face of that, a patient with a continuous rise in PSA values 
And these are at a minimum of one week uh, with at least three values measured four, four weeks apart. So, uh, or the progression of uh, new radiographic disease or clinical progression. Another important definition, and this is based on conventional imaging with a CT scan and x-ray, is low volume and high volume metastatic disease. Uh, basically, high volume is the presence of visceral metastases or greater than uh, e or equal to uh, four bone metastases with at least one outside the vertebral column. And, um, and then um, low volume is essentially uh, less than four. Uh, high risk metastatic disease uh, are patients that have a poor prognosis in the presence of two of the three following high risk features. Gleason score greater than eight, greater than three bone lesions or visceral metastases. So again, high volume and high risk, essentially synonymous. So prostate cancer uh, death rates have been increasing, uh, and there were 34,000 men who died last year. It constitutes about 11% of the cancer deaths in men. It is the most commonly diagnosed cancer. And as I mentioned, the incidence of metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer has been increasing. This is looking at some recent trends in disease. Several things to point out here uh, at both uh, localized, regional, and distant disease rates have been increasing. And you can see this across all uh, ethnicities. The second thing to realize is that uh, for our patients, our black patients, that they do have a higher uh, rate of presenting with distant disease. Uh, and a lot of that may have to actually do with socioeconomic rather than uh, 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 hurdles, rather than uh, issues with the cancer itself. In an equal access system, uh, response rates and survival rates are, are similar. So that's clearly something we as a society need to work on. Now, it's important in this landscape of uh, changing prostate cancer care to have a multidisciplinary team that includes not only urologists, but medical oncologists. We have a great set of radiation oncologists here and pathologists as well. And we utilize our genetic counselors in this modern era much more uh, than in the past. The, uh, as far as early evaluation and counseling, uh, pa these patients need histologic uh, confirmation of their disease. Uh, it's important to discuss all of the treatment options in these patients with advanced care and will typically, advanced cancer will typically have these patients see not only a surgeon, but a medical oncologist, as well as a radiation oncologist to talk about all of the potential options. So it's against, uh, uh, it's important to realize that when it comes to prostate cancer, keep in mind that many of these patients are older. And as Willett Whitmore, who was a urologist uh, uh, for, uh, from a number of years ago, had meant, noted the potential for full expression of the disease in older men is limited by the likelihood of death from other causes. So this is something that we always need to keep in mind when we're thinking about treatment options. So in patients with biochemical recurrence, that is, they failed local therapy uh, without metastatic disease, PSA recurrence almost always precedes clinical detection of metastases. And these patients should undergo serial PSA measurements clinical evaluation, and staging evaluations. Now, in the past, we have typically uh, recommended um, imaging with CT scan, bone scan, and invariably that was uh, negative. In the modern era, and this is uh, new on the guidelines, uh, it's being recommended that these patients obtain PSMA PET imaging and realize that for a PSMA, uh, for a patient with a PSA of 0.2, that about 30 of these patients will be positive on PSMA PET imaging. So again, it's a very, it's a much more sensitive way of determining uh, where and these patients have disease recurrence. Now, uh, when I gave, when I talked to you all a couple of years ago, we were still using uh, flucyclovine or oxymin scans, PET scans. Uh, choline was being used very infrequently in part because of uh, the very short half-life of this that uh, isotope. Now uh, we've completely shifted over to PSMA PET imaging. There are two improved uh, or two FDA approved uh, imaging um, modalities. One is gallium and the other is uh, PYL. 
we're generally using uh, mainly PYL here at the University of Wisconsin. Again, this is a specific uh, a molecule that binds the transmembrane prote protein uh, receptor and uh, uh, again, specifically allows us to identify where the area of recurrence is. So in biochemical recurrence uh, without metastatic disease, in the past, these men were typically treated with androgen deprivation therapy very early on. There became this realization that there's a lot of uh, comorbidities induced by ADT, you know, cardiac disease, you know, bone density loss, muscle wasting. Uh, there are potentially uh, cognitive issues that arise. So the recent guidelines, a major change over the last couple of years has been uh, that for these patients with a rising PSA, clinicians should offer observation. This is in the absence of metastatic disease or clinical trial enrollment. And ADT is not routinely recommended in this population. But if, it, if the patient uh, uh, really feels that something is necessary, uh, in this setting, will uh, the guidelines recommend intermittent androgen deprivation therapy for these patients. So this is just looking at the long natural history of prostate cancer in a setting. Uh, this was one of many studies looking at about 400 men with biochemical recurrence after surgery. Uh, these patients uh, didn't receive uh, any neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapy, uh, except later in their disease. The median follow-up after radical prostatectomy uh, was 10 years, and the uh, cancer-specific survival was 15, uh, after 15 years after biochemical recurrence was 55%. Again, emphasizing the long natural history uh, for this disease in many men. So how do you stratify uh, risk for these patients? Basically, there we go. Oh, this is a nomogram uh, looking at uh, 2,000 men. And what we see here is there are a couple of features that can help us predict who might develop metastases quicker uh, with biochemical recurrence. One is uh, age. Another is uh, the time to biochemical recurrence, individuals who have a longer period of time after their surgery before they develop a detectable PSA, uh, typically have a, a better mortality. PSA doubling time uh, plays a major role in this, and you can see the impact of this on this nomogram here. Uh, also, uh, the PSA at the biochemical recurrence and the preoperative PSA play a role. Uh, pathologic Gleason score, Gleason, higher Gleason score, uh, more rapid uh, biochemical recurrence, and progression of metastases. Uh, all of these play uh, less of a, a role, the margins, extraprostatic extension, although seminal vesicle invasion uh, does have a major uh, impact. So with regard to intermittent AD androgen deprivation therapy, uh, this is just showing uh, outcomes from a study uh, that was performed. You can see with continuous or intermittent, there's really no difference in overall survival in these patients. How do we give this? Uh, typically, what we'll do is when the patient decides to, uh, for, to go on androgen deprivation therapy, uh, we'll place them on this for nine months to a year until the PSA nadirs below, zero, below one, uh, take them off it. Uh, then there's again a 12, 18, 24 month period of time where the PSA gradually increases and then restart them on this. So uh, this provides so-called drug holidays and the quality of life is better for these patients if they need to be put on androgen deprivation therapy. So let's uh, shift gears now and talk about metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And uh, the presence and extent plays a major role in determining how we uh, uh, treat these patients. So radiographic assessment, uh, conventional imaging, uh, what I would point out in this modern era that uh, we more typically we're beginning to use PSMA PET imaging to help us in evaluate these patients. And I would recommend to the group that instead of ordering a bone scan, CT scan, just get a PSMA PET scan. Uh, it's been shown that financially, this is a poten potentially the single imaging approach is cheaper and uh, more insurance companies are now paying for it as well. Uh, discuss sympt uh, ongoing symptoms, uh, urinary bone pain. Uh, it's important to get baseline and serial PSAs in these patients. And in patients with, that present with metastatic disease, genetic counseling is also an important part 
of their management in this modern era. Clinicians should also, uh, so we talked about assessing metastatic disease. Uh, one question that comes up is uh, when a patient presents, when should we get imaging? So basically, uh, you can use this based on these Damico risk factors, uh, T3A or greater, any grade group four or five cancer should be imaged, or any PSA greater than 20. So if you have a grade group three cancer and a PSA of 21, they should get imaged. Uh, conversely, if you have a grade group uh, three cancer and a PSA of nine, uh, we generally uh, won't recommend imaging in that setting. Part of it depends on the volume. Uh, newly diagnosed metastatic hormone sensitive uh, prostate cancer patients, uh, you need to determine whether these are low or high volume. And again, high volume is greater than or equal to four bone metastases uh, with at least one metastasis outside of the spine or pelvis and or the presence of visceral metastases. So if you have a, uh, a for example, a liver metastasis, uh, that, that patient is merely uh, goes into a different uh, category than patient with just bony disease. Uh, clinicians should also uh, assess if there's symptoms and treat these. And then finally, uh, maintaining uh, or uh, uh, the PS P evaluating the PSA, monitoring the PSA in these patients, especially after beginning a treatment, uh, is important. And there are patients that you'll begin on treatment that may not necessarily have a decrease in their PSA or may not have regression of their disease. So this question of genetic uh, counseling and all patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, uh, we should offer germline testing for. The reason for this is several years ago, uh, and I'll show this study, uh, there was a recognition that these genes that are important in DNA repair uh, also play a role in risk of dying from prostate cancer. And somebody finally did the right study where they actually took patients that had died from prostate cancer and sequenced their uh, disease. And in these men, they found they were germline mutations. Again, these are uh, in contrast to somatic, which are in tumor in the tumor itself, uh, these are actually within the germline. Uh, these DNA repair defects consisting mainly of BRCA2, BRCA1, and ATM. So in these patients, it's important to get a complete family history. Do you have a, a family history of early breast cancer? Uh, what about colon cancer? Again, some uh, Lynch syndrome. So this kind of uh, more extensive family history is important, and it's striking how often you know, we will uh, find patients that say, yeah, my mother died at 47 from breast cancer. Uh, this patient now has uh, prostate cancer. And we've uncovered quite a few uh, of these uh, uh, DNA uh, mutation uh, or germline mutations now in our population here. Why is this important? Number one, uh, these patients, uh, we need to be careful about uh, active surveillance in this population. They have a higher progression uh, rate. Uh, and then number two is um, the, the fact that it can help direct therapy. So this is actually looking at uh, germ germline DNA repair gene mutations in uh, men uh, that have uh, are they more common in lethal prostate cancer? So if you just look at indolent versus uh, uh, patients who died from uh, prostate cancer, and you can see the, that uh, these are much more, there's are selected for in patients that have actually died from their cancer versus those with more indolent cases. So highlighting the, the background of DNA repair alterations and their role in cancer progression. But luckily we do have uh, and several drugs now that have been uh, developed to target these DNA, uh, these uh, DNA uh, repair mutations. Uh, this is uh, in patients with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. Uh, Olaparib, this was the profound trial uh, looking at survival of these patients. They either got uh, standard of care or Olaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor. And you can see that there was an uh, probability of uh, imaging-based progression-free survival was markedly improved in these patients that got uh, olaparib. So this is FDA approved. It was followed shortly uh, by the Triton 3 study, which was just published earlier this year, also demonstrating that rucaparib 
again, a PARP inhibitor uh, uh, improves progressions-free survival in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. There are trials going on right now to determine whether you can actually move these uh, PARP inhibitors early in, earlier in the disease, so these patients that have DNA uh, repair alterations, whether you can, in fact, apply these early in the disease uh, to improve outcomes, even in patients with uh, hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, uh, but those trials are ongoing. So, uh, in metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, uh, patients should offer androgen deprivation therapy in combination with either androgen pathway-directed therapy, including abiraterone, apalutamide, enzalutamide, or chemotherapy. And this is based on a whole series of trials. I'm going to just touch on a several of these, but ADT alone is not standard of care in this modern era. In only selected situations, it would be utilized. The other, uh, in selected patients with uh, de novo metastatic prostate cancer, uh, patients should now offer androgen deprivation therapy in combination with dos docetaxel and either abiraterone uh, or dermalutamide. So this is a new guideline, basically looking at triple, triplet therapy. So in the past, uh, we've given ADT plus uh, one of these androgen pathway signaling inhibitors or chemotherapy, but now uh, they're based on several studies, and we'll talk about these, uh, triplet therapy is being recommended for these uh, patients that are presenting with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. These patients do much worse than those patients that have uh, metastatic disease from after biochemical failure. And that's important for the residents on your test to realize that distinction. Biochemical failure, metastatic disease have a much better prognosis than de novo metastatic disease. So uh, this is uh, the study that really kicked the whole, this whole combination therapy with androgen deprivation therapy off. Um, uh, I was a, a co-author on this study. It was the charted trial that was published uh, back. The original study was uh, published back in uh, 2016. And it, it demonstrated uh, that there was uh, essentially a, a nine-month improvement in survival in patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer that got docetaxel and androgen deprivation therapy. The, uh, uh, this was reiterated in a trial uh, done in Europe, uh, the STAMPEDE trial, again, showing uh, better uh, failure-free survival and improved overall survival in these patients. Now, it's important to realize these patients were stratified for high risk and low risk, and the high risk really had a marked uh, benefit. Uh, low risk patients, those patients with uh, uh, less than four uh, bony lesions, uh, the difference was not that uh, great or was not st statistically significant. So uh, several years ago, uh, in 2017, uh, there was the LATITUDE trial looking at abiraterone. Again, this is an oral agent, an, an androgen singling inhibitor, and uh, overall survival was improved in these metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer patients radiographic progression-free survival, quality of life uh, parameters were also improved for these patients. And you can see, um, look at the uh, overall survival. It was not reached in the uh, arm that got abiraterone versus 35 months in the ADT plus placebo. This is looking, uh, again, in the stampede, one of the stampede trials, overall survival improved with abiraterone. So again, uh, phase three trial, showing a benefit to this. So uh, this is looking at, uh, just to remind you about the mechanism of abiraterone. Uh, it's important to realize that intratumoral levels of androgens and castration-resistant disease remain very high. And abiraterone is essentially an irreversible inhibitor of CYP17-alpha uh, hydroxylase. Uh, and uh, also, so essentially it's blocking uh, both this, 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 and this uh, steps of the pathway, the conversion to DHEA. Uh, and again, DHEA uh, is an adrenal mechanism for increasing androgen levels. Uh, there are side effects associated with this. Primarily, uh, there's increased aldosterone uh, production. And so these patients have hypertension and low potassium. Uh, so you have to keep, uh, again, monitor their blood pressure, work with your primary care physician on this. 
Another aspect about this is uh, there's an uh, inc uh, increase in, in cortisol, and so we give prednisone basically in conjunction with this in order to uh, uh, prevent some of these side effects. So uh, these patients, uh, as urologists, we can monitor these and, and treat them. The, uh, there are uh, several other randomized trials in addition. Uh, so we talked about the abiraterone uh, with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Uh, also, we talked about the, the, the docetaxel. Uh, this has been also shown uh, the, in metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer that combining androgen deprivation therapy with enzalutamide and apalutamide also improves outcomes. And just to remind you, enzalutamide is an androgen receptor signaling inhibitor. Uh, so it's essentially a second generation Casidex or flutamide. And it was uh, rationally designed to, to target androgen receptor signaling at multiple steps. It not only inhibits the binding of the androgens to the androgen receptor, but it inhibits nuclear translocation of the androgen receptor and it inhibits association of the androgen receptor with DNA. So again, this is all uh, testable uh, for the residents uh, on, your, on your boards. Uh, it's important to realize that apalutamide and darolutamide have a very similar mechanism to action. They're essentially very similar drugs uh, with some mild side effects. So uh, what patients is, so enzalutamide and these uh, ASIs are uh, approved for hormone-sensitive, metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, which we're talking about today, but also castration-resistant disease. Uh, these patients do have uh, a lot of fatigue. Uh, you need to be careful about individuals with uh, uh, prior seizure history, and uh, there is some CNS-related uh, side effects associated with enzalutamide. For that reason, it's, uh, and sometimes an elderly man, abiraterone is a better option for these uh, patients. So again, a history of seizure, strokes, or falls, significant fatigue or advanced age, probably want to lean away from uh, considering enzalutamide. So how do you choose between chemotherapy, so a patient with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, uh, between docetaxel chemotherapy or an androgen receptor pathway inhibitor. So all patients in this modern era should be offered uh, treatment intensification. So androgen deprivation therapy alone uh, should be uh, only reserved for a subset of, of patients in very specific situations. Uh, in part, the approach uh, varies uh, uh, based on cost or side effects. Docetaxel is actually the least expensive of all these options. It's given for six cycles. Uh, these individuals have to be chemotherapy fit, good performance status. The nice thing about it is you do your six cycles over six months and then the therapy stopped and you continue on androgen deprivation therapy. So you do the therapy, get through it, and, and you move on. on the, in contrast, abiraterone is given constantly. Uh, it is now a generic drug, so it's somewhat cheaper. Uh, again, we, as we talked about, you need to monitor these patients for low potassium, hypertension. It can also alter the liver function tests uh, since it's metabolized through there. In patients that have elevated transaminases, you need to decrease the drug dose or, uh, in an effort uh, or stop the drug for uh, several half-lives before restarting. Oops. Should I approve this? Decline? Okay. Just a, just a virus. Um, so, and they're also on long-term prednisone as well. So there's some advantages. It's cheap, uh, generally tolerated in older patients, but you need to be careful in brittle diabetics uh, with this approach. Enzalutamide is more expensive, less monitoring, uh, and so, which is an advantage. Uh, there are some um, neurocognitive issues, the fatigue I mentioned uh, with this. And then apalutamide is very similar to enzalutamide as far as its uh, side effect profile. There is a, a significant rash, though, that does develop uh, with this. There may be less neurocognitive issues with apalutamide, maybe not as much uh, central uh, nervous system penetration of the drug. 
So this is something that's new in the guidelines. It's called triplet therapy. And so if, if ADT plus uh, one drug is good, what if we give chemotherapy, oral therapy, and ADT? And so this was a, a study that was done in patients. Uh, 86 of these were, 86% of these patients presented with uh, metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. So again, this is for patients with de novo uh, metastatic disease. Uh, there was an improved median overall survival uh, in these patients. And one thing I was just going to point out this is standard of care. Again, patients presenting with metastatic disease, you know, traditionally we've said metastatic disease, you know, three year survival. But if you look at the control arm for this, you know, these patients, uh, it's, it's 49 months. So we're clearly doing better as far as uh, managing these patients. These patients that got uh, ADT, docetaxel, plus or minus darolutamide, um, they uh, had a, uh, an improvement in survival. And uh, notably, patients with these uh, aggressive, very aggressive features, visceral disease, um, uh, and rapidly rising PSA, these are patients we may want to consider for this type of triplet therapy. I'd say it's being used uh, less frequently here at the current time, uh, but uh, there are some patients that are candidates for this, and it's important to realize uh, that it is an option for patients. Um, this is just, again, looking at the uh, improvement in time to development of castration-resistant prostate cancer in these patients, uh, a marked improvement. Uh, pain progression improved again on patients in triplet therapy. And uh, one question, though, is, is whether it's superior to ADT versus darolutamide alone. And um, uh, so I, I think, the, the, to a certain extent, when we look at the overall survival numbers, uh, that is the case. Toxicity profile is always important when we think about triplet therapy. So you're taking two drugs, now adding three drugs. Uh, and it's not meaningfully more toxic than just ADT docetaxel alone. So by adding darolutamide to this, it doesn't appear to, to add too much additional toxicity. So these patients uh, are able to tolerate this. This was another trial, uh, a, a similar trial using aber abiraterone triplet uh, for patients in metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, the PEACE-1 trial. And what we see here is that the overall population, uh, this is looking at uh, radiographic progression-free survival, a marked improvement in the patients that got the addition of uh, abiraterone to ADT docetaxel. Uh, and uh, so, so again, uh, it, there's a lot of debate going on right now. How do you specifically define the triplet uh, population? I think m uh, most of these patients are, are these high-risk patients that would be considered for this. So uh, we're not going to have a, a radiation therapy talk this year, uh, but I did want to just mention in the guidelines uh, the role of radiation in patients with oligometastatic disease. So in these patients that present with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer in low-volume disease, generally pelvic metastases, cl clinicians may offer radiotherapy to the prostate in combination with androgen deprivation therapy. And this trial... Uh, was a stampede trial, a phase three trial. And if you looked at uh, the overall survival and low metastatic burden, you can see that the control arm versus the, the rate, which was androgen deprivation ther therapy versus radiotherapy combination uh, was improved in low metastatic burden, high metastatic burden, no difference. So in general, uh, there are a subset of patients uh, that present with this oligometastatic disease that may be a candidate for this. Again, this is just looking at one of the graphs, uh, look uh, essentially at the risk, relative risk of these patients. Uh, really low burden uh, benefited, high burden did not. And this was uh, previously uh, validated from a second trial, the HORAD trial, which had hypothesized that these lower uh, uh, these low risk, lower risk uh, oligometastatic patients uh, had an improved survival as well. So uh, that's something to think about. I would say this has evolved uh, to include patients getting abiraterone plus radiation therapy. 
Uh, there are several trials ongoing right now. They didn't quite make the guidelines because they're not published yet. But uh, I would expect as the field moves forward that there'll be radiation combinations uh, with a number of these other drugs looking again to improve local control. And the reason that we've known about this for a number of years, that there potentially is better survival in patients with prostate, with advanced disease when you control the prostate. And this is looking at a couple of uh, studies. Uh, these were actually SEER-based uh, studies. Uh, on the right is a, a patient, a group of patients from the SEER database. Uh, and just retrospectively looking back at patients that got uh, no treatment to the prostate, uh, brachytherapy, or radical prostatectomy. And the survival uh, probability in those patients with, that developed systemic disease uh, and died was markedly improved for those patients that got, that got treatment to the prostate. Uh, this was also this is just another graph. Looking at this, this was uh, seen in, uh, again, another retrospective trial. It is interesting when you look at these studies that the survival benefit is actually somewhat better with radical prostatectomy than radiotherapy. Now, again, these are retrospective studies. There may be a selection bias, uh, but it is a, an interesting piece of information and really begs the question, in patients with metastatic disease, should we, we be removing the prostate? The uh, one other thing uh, that I would say about this is part of the rationale for this is the untreated prostate throughout the life. These patients are living so much longer that throughout the, the life of these patients, the if the prostate's not treated, it continues to shed cells into the bloodstream, uh, which again can develop new metastases. So that's part of the rationale uh, for treatment with prostate uh, of the prostate. So this is looking at several of these trials in oligometastatic disease, looking at uh, surgery. And unfortunately, the SWOG 1802 is not accruing very well. Uh, this is basically, basically taking patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, uh, starting them on androgen deprivation therapy and, and removing their prostates versus just getting uh, uh, versus just standard therapy. Uh, unfortunately, it got sort of caught up in the new imaging approach with PSMA PET, and there are a lot of things that are going on. So I'm not sure that this trial is going to actually uh, uh, complete accrual. And then there are a couple of other trials being done uh, in Europe. So this issue of, uh, I just wanted to briefly spend a minute talking about neoadjuvant therapy. And I think for us, us as surgeons, there's always going to be a role for uh, uh, removing the prostate, even in advanced disease. The question is whether you can take a patient uh, with uh, hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, high-risk features, and pre-treat them, get rid of the, the distant metastases, shrink down the tumor, and then take the prostate out. And again, this is performed routinely for colon cancer. It's a common uh, approach in bladder cancer. And uh, so the question is whether this plays a, a role in prostate cancer. There have been a whole series of studies uh, done uh, out of Dana-Farber looking at combinations of um, is essentially androgen receptor uh, antagonists. There was one study where they gave the patients apalutamide, abiraterone, prednisone, and luprolide. So get, that's a, how's that for a study? Uh, obviously, a lot of side effects with all those drugs. Uh, but they were only to drive, they, they showed improved pathologic responses, uh, but again, you can only push androgen uh, signaling inhibitors so, so far. There's also been one a randomized phase three trial, uh, the PUNCH trial. Again, these patients got uh, docetaxel chemotherapy and androgen deprivation therapy for six months prior to surgery. And it's intriguing study uh, this is actually looking at the need for additional therapy. So uh, patients uh, develop a PSA failure, go on and get additional therapy. And you can see that the neoadjuvant arm uh, did much better than the surgery alone arm. If we look at overall survival, uh, there was a slight uh, improvement. But again, there was uh, toxicity associated with this. Patients are often not willing to wait six months uh, before their surgery. And this is not being used uh, broadly at, at the present time. We did run a trial here uh, using ADT plus docetaxel uh, for 
uh, several years. Uh, this is it. Uh, this is this chemo-hormonal therapy. We're actually looking at this mainly uh, in addition from a research standpoint, looking at areas of resistance within, within the prostate and why do you have some tumors that respond and others that don't. Uh, so in our trial here, these patients got docetaxel chemotherapy for three months plus ADT, uh, went ahead and removed the prostates. And we actually looked at um, predictors of biochemical failure in our, in our study. This was presented a couple of years ago by uh, Ashanda Estale, one of our fellows, and showed that at one year, uh, it was only about 58% of patients had a failure. These are very high-risk patients, you know, PSAs in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, and some of these predictors of biochemical failure included positive surgical margins and preoperative uh, PSMA pet nodal disease. I would say also we've, we've become interested in uh, looking at androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, and this had been looked at in the past in some randomized studies, but, but so whether you can treat patients with ADT prior to surgery and improve their outcomes. The studies that were done in the past, unfortunately, included a lot of sort of intermediate and lower risk patients. So it was never a definitive study. There was really no difference seen between the arms. But I would say in our high risk uh, group here, and again, these patients have very high PSAs, uh, locally extensive cancer, it does decrease the positive margin rate. So I'm comparing it to just a standard of care population uh, that we ran uh, similar, similarly at the same time. And the biochemical failure rate is also lower, and that was actually uh, uh, significant. It's 66% uh, in the standard of, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, this, in the group that got standard of care, uh, it was a failure rate of 66% versus 41% I have this backwards here, uh, in the uh, ADT group. So at one year, there was a lower risk of biochemical failure. So it, it begs the question, uh, again, androgen deprivation therapy might play a role uh, in a subset of very high-risk patients. Uh, we do have an ongoing trial, which is uh, based on this, that the residents certainly know about that have come through my clinic. Uh, this is actually part of our uh, prostate cancer SPORE, and this is a randomized uh, phase two trial looking at a DNA uh, androgen receptor uh, vaccine. So the patients are either randomized to androgen deprivation therapy, ADT plus this vaccine, and ADT plus this vaccine plus a drug called nivolumab, which is a PDL1 inhibitor, which sort of amps up the immune system. And so that's an ongoing trial right now that uh, we're uh, uh, offering patients. Uh, and so very high risk patients uh, with presenting with metastatic hormone sensitive or oligometastatic uh, disease, uh, that's an option. Uh, again, we're uh, another trial uh, associated with our uh, SPORE is uh, just looking at markers of resistance uh, after chemo-hormonal therapy. So uh, several of you have heard me talk about, and uh, Dr. Richards had alluded to this uh, prostate cancer SPORE. Uh, this is really a huge effort, uh, and there are 17 investigators, eight departments across campus, and really the focus is on moving uh, uh, ideas from the, the lab into the clinic, and also taking clinical observations and trying to explain them uh, in the lab. And, and an example of that is this resistance issue. Uh, this is just a picture of our uh, SPORE team, or as many of them as we could get together in one, the room at one time. So take home messages. Uh, again, early androgen deprivation therapy for biochemical recurrence is not indicated. Uh, these patients should be observed or go on clinical trials. Uh, ADT uh, should be combined with docetaxel or androgen signaling inhibitors or both uh, in these very high-risk metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer patients. Radiation therapy plus ADT improves survival in low-volume metastatic disease. The big question is surgery right now, and as I said, uh, we're focusing on neoadjuvant uh, approaches for high-risk uh, disease. I think that the answer is probably going to be out there uh, and maybe in the future we'll be able to do a biopsy, do a genetic analysis, figure out what your tumor is sensitive to, uh, treat you neoadjuvantly, and then do surgery in that setting. That's really the goal. 
And then finally, um, PSMA PET imaging, and Dr. Cho will be here in, I think, two weeks uh, to talk about uh, 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 these, these new imaging approaches. Uh, and it's really changing the field. A lot of the studies that we've done in the past, unfortunately, were based on conventional imaging. Uh, but I think it's this overall, it's, it's really been a profound change being able to talk to patients about where their disease is and then just sort of guessing. Uh, and then finally, as uh, genetics will change our management, and it's, it's playing an increasing role in uh, these patients that present with high risk disease. Okay, so I'll stop there and take any questions. Uh, thank you, Dave. You know, really uh, fantastic uh, state of the art lecture. So the first thing I'll say is, I think it's it's somewhat understated how substantive you know, having a spore at Wisconsin is. And so, heartiest congratulations to you and the team uh, for that achievement. Um, with regards to the talk, uh, I, I'm glad uh, that uh, you, you think there's still a need to remove the prostate. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, I would make the case that's not the goal, right? And, um, you know, when we first met in 1995, uh, I would have predicted, you know, this surgery might be unnecessary, you know, in 2023, but, but it remains just like we still have to make holes in people to remove kidney stones, which, which I also would like to stop doing, but, you know, it just doesn't uh, happen that way. Um, with regards to, you know, the balance of the, the information, uh, you said it quietly, but I'll say it more loudly, you know, basically for the residents, you know, this slide deck is a guarantee on your uh, in-service exam, and if not there, in your qualifying exam, and if not there, your certifying exam. Uh, I remember uh, looking at these protocols thinking, boy, who's going to know this? And basically everyone knows it. So uh, this is a very important review. Uh, my, my question to you, Dave, though, is a harder one. And, you know, I think... Uh, as a practicing urologist who's not an oncologist, at what point uh, in this cascade in the treatment event of advanced prostate cancer should the urologist either cease or is there a point where they, they should cease and can they give these drugs themselves? Uh, I know that's a highly variable practice in the United States based on what I've seen uh, from recertification logs. So, so what's your honest opinion on how much of this a practicing urologist should do? So I think that a lot depends on the practice environment, but uh, we teach a, an advanced prostate cancer course. It's a full day course at the AUA every year. And there are a lot of individuals there that have a, that are urologists that have advanced practice, uh, prostate cancer practices. So they're giving abiraterone, enzalutamide, uh, they're doing genetic counseling and genetic testing. So a lot of this, uh, what I've run over, is certainly within the purview of uh, a urologist. Uh, the question is whether you want to undertake this. I mean, obviously a patient on abiraterone needs monitoring liver function tests, uh, potassium, hypertension. You know, there are a number of uh, uh, aspects about this that do need further management. But... It's definitely within the purview of a urologist. And I would say, to answer your question, it's going to be variable when you would necessarily send this patient on to a, um, to a medical oncologist. Again, in these patients with high-risk disease, presenting with uh, widespread metastases, visceral metastases, those patients often will need to think about uh, more aggressive chemotherapy early on, so recognizing that disting uh, distinguishing feature is important. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a, I'd say there's a whole new area for urologists, and that's why, again, this is, a lot of this is on your boards. Uh, I would say when we used to take my boards when I was uh, younger, we had androgen depriva deprivation therapy. You know, should it be Lupron alone or Casadex and Lupron? That was about it. So uh, it's gotten much more, uh, much more uh, advanced, but that's better for our patients too. Along those lines, Dave, is there any role for bicalutamide um, in 2023? 
So uh, again, it, it's essentially what we term a first generation um, you know, androgen receptor blocker. These newer agents that we have are, are much better as monotherapy, but uh, we still use it to block a flare. So if you have a patient come in, coming in with a lot of pain uh, and they'll, they'll need to start an androgen deprivation therapy, it's, it's hard to get the insurance company to approve abiraterone or enzalutamide right away. Uh, but it's much easier to just give them Casadex, get them started on that, start them on uh, then uh, uh, Lupron, or you can give them Degarelix. But again, it's a, a little more challenge from an insurance standpoint. But long term, no. So these patients, uh, as far as being on uh, flutamide or Casadex, it's typically just a month lead in in these advanced uh, prostate cancer patients with metastatic disease. Quick question: Is um, has PSMA, PSMA PET basically replaced everything else for staging? Yes. At every stage of the disease. Yeah. And is it widely available? Because that was the okay. Yeah, insurance companies are paying uh, for it now much more. You know, it's been sort of this you know tug of war thing. Uh, originally, we had to really fight in biochemical recurrence to get them to approve it. Eventually, they did, but. The studies started coming out that you can get all this imaging, bone scan, CT scan, or just the PSMA PET, and it's cheaper. So why not just do it? So for patients uh, at higher risk uh, that are presenting with the disease, just get PSMA PET imaging. So, because of these DNA repair defects, you know, they have an enhanced, um, essentially, PARP signaling, which is uh, utilized in, in sort of cell survival. So, that makes them profoundly more sensitive to PARP inhibitors. Um, you know, it's a, it's a spectrum of DNA mutations that they develop because of these DNA repair alterations. So, as far as the nice thing about this is it's really targeting sort of the upstream issue rather than this array of different uh, mutations that are seen. And that's the, the frustrating thing about solid tumors is they're very heterogeneous. And so we're always looking for that driver mutation that really, uh, the thing that really you can really target that will, again, kill the cell. So PARP inhibitors are, are a, a real benefit. The other component to know is you can sometimes, uh, there is a subset of um, uh, drugs uh, that target microsatellite instability, which occurs in a subset of these patients as well. So, so again, it's, it's, uh, the mutational spectrum is pretty broad with these DNA repair alterations. Okay. Jeremy? Yeah, so you're talking about like enzalutamide, darolutamide, apalutamide. Yeah, part of it may be uh, just just what's available. Um, darolutamide was the most recent one. Uh, it's in so insurance companies are not. It's not as well known. Enzalutamide. I, I don't know when exactly the patent runs out on it, but that will become generic before too long here. So, um, and apalutamide is pretty similar to. To enzalutamide, there are is a rash, and and you do get some uh, can get some thyroid issues with it, but I would you know enzalutamide is probably the the most broadly used, and just from a cost standpoint, uh, insurance companies are more familiar with it. Great, thank. You. Any other questions, comments? If not, we'll uh, transition to. Uh, green and purple indications. So we'll take a couple minutes to load those slides. Thanks again, Dave. Yeah, certainly. 